House and Chains fans, and welcome to episode number three of the Let's Learn Facelift Guitar and Analysis Series. Today, we are going to live tomorrow, and we are certainly not going to follow bad transcriptions, and we are definitely not going to wallow in a sea of wrong notes from lackluster internet tabs. Instead, we will be swimming at breakneck speed through every single note, every single time change, every single chord progression in a full detailed musical analysis of Sea of Sorrow by Alice in Chains. Time to open fire. Sea of Sorrow gives us all of the things that we love about Alice in Chains. Great vocal lines, great riffs, great bass lines, drum fills, and even a little bit of boogie-woogie thrown in there. Now this song also gives us a little bit extra, and I will elaborate on that once we listen to this classic introduction. Now just like every other Alice in Chains song we've done so far, we need to bring the guitar down a half step every single string. So we're going to be in E flat standard. So E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, B flat, and E flat. So make sure you do that first. Now let's check out what's going on with this rhythm part. This entire section is based within the E minor blues with a little bit of extra stuff going on. But let me play it kind of slow and I'll gloss over it as I move along, okay? So we're coming in on these 8th and the 7th fret of the D and the G string, just like this. You're going to hit that twice and then in between you're going to hit the open E string. Now we're going to use our fingers for all of this, right? And then as you hit the ninth and the ninth. You're going to let that open E string ring out underneath. That's going to be very important throughout this entire introduction. Check that out again. Watch real slow. All right. And you want to give it a little bit of palm mute too, but still let it ring. So that's kind of a tricky technique if you're not used to doing that. The next time around, we tack on some more notes, adding further to the bluesy element. So check this out. to the 12th fret now to expand on that previous idea. So we're coming from here, that first bit, and then right over here, and you're going to hit that twice, but you're also going to hit the low E string twice in between as well. And then ending it with that little bend, release, and coming down to the 12th fret. So once again, real slow. special attention to where those open E's are because you're gonna have to play that verbatim as we move along. And then the very last one just kind of ends it down low. So let's check that out. Open, so straight up the open D and G string on the top there, and then here. And then another mute on the bottom followed by the ninth and the ninth. So all in all, that open E string at the bottom needs to be ringing out the entire time, minus one bit. So I'm going to play through the whole thing slow, and I'll show you where that is. Ready? Hold. Open E is ringing on the bottom. Still. Ready? Ring. Not ring. Right there is where it stops when we go up to that little lick on top of the E minor. Okay? And then we continue on. That's ringing out on the bottom once again. And then for the ending, when you hit the open D and G strings, the open E string will also be ringing. So really the sound we're getting is this. Pretty cool. And then of course, you still want it ringing at the end there as well. So basically the open E is going to ring every single time except for when we go up to the 12th and the 14th fret. Now while this is a blues sequence, and Alice in Chains, as well as many other grunge bands, use the blues very often, this adds a certain element of complexity to the entire arrangement because it's not just bluesy, it's also a little bit jazzy. Let's just look at the first chord that is being played. So we're going to put that under a microscope. So we have this combined with that. This is a B flat and a D on top of an E 
Now you play that at the same time and you're thinking, wow, that's pretty dissonant. Well, that's because it is. We're actually creating an interval on the E, a flatted fifth, which is the B flat, and a flatted seventh, which is the D. All right, both of those basically exemplify the blues. The flat fifth gives us the super bluesy feel. Okay, and the flat seventh also gives us that super bluesy feel. It's almost like an unresolved tension that uh, must be resolved, but is not. So listen to that again. That's that tritone interval between the E and the B flat and the flatted seventh on the top as well. This creates an E half diminished seventh, or also known as an E minor seven flat five. This is a chord often found in jazz music and usually happens naturally as the two chord of the minor scale. But here we are putting it in full force as it resolves back to its one chord as a one chord itself. So it's basically a half diminished as a one chord. Lots of tension and color. The E minor seven flat five consists of the root, flat third, flat fifth, flat seventh. And together we get this. Adding to the sophistication even further is a piano part credited to drummer Sean Kinney. So credit to him for his multi-instrumentalism. Let's take a listen to what that sounds like. Overall, the piano plays the same notes as the guitar, but there are a couple slight differences that build the bigger picture. The first lick is played exactly the same as the guitar, but the second lick has a slight difference. Listen here. Since the piano can't bend notes like the guitar can, it has to approach it a little bit differently. It's literally the difference between one note. And the only other difference is at the very end. At this part, the guitar plays a regular power chord. And the piano plays this power chord with a flat seventh on top. It's just a one note difference, but it's noticeable enough where it deserves to be pointed out. Now that we fully grasp the rhythm tracks, the piano and the guitar, Let's take a look at the other guitar that's playing at the introduction, the lead guitar on the slide. This entire section uses a slide, so let's get ready to do our best Dwayne Allman impression. Now, I lost my slide, my proper guitar slide, so I had to improvise. So I'm going to use this Great American Scream Machine shot glass to get through the whole part. Let's start with the fret positions first. We actually have to go from the 4th fret to the ninth. little vibrato on there, come back from the ninth to the 7th. Then open G, immediately followed by this slide. All right, then hit it again, slide down, hit the G, add a little bit of a wiggle behind the nut. That's right, we want to bend behind the nut back there. Add a little bit of vibrato, Iron Man style, but this is a little more subtle because it sounds like you could have been doing it with the slide, but I'm pretty sure it's the open G behind the nut. We then come up to the seventh fret of the B string going up to the 12th. It's the same leap as the first part, so it's going to sound like this, but up here. See that? And then hold it up at the top, then come down, same leap, but downward on the B string and then to the seventh fret of the D string, just like that. Not the D string, the G string, I'm sorry. Before getting into the theory of all this, let me just mention something about slide technique. Basically what you want to do is you want to put the slide right at the fret, the far fret. So if you're on the fourth fret, you want to go slightly into the next fret, or right onto the bar, and that'll keep it in tune, all right? Because if you're low, it's going to be way out of tune. You hear how much worse that sounds? You're going to sound flat all the way through. 
you want to be right on that fret bar, okay? And the slide allows you to do this, because you can't do that with your fingers. It would sound like total doo-doo caca. Now, you're going to want another finger, at least one other finger, touching the string just behind it. So it's basically as if you're muting it like this, but with the slide pressed down. And that'll keep any weird noises from occurring. Now, obviously, using a shot glass is not the ideal you know, way to do this. You want to get yourself a proper slide, but you can use other household objects as slides as well if you're in a pickle. All right, You can't use an actual pickle, and certainly don't try to use your own pickle for this either. Now let's get into the theory behind this. So basically we're starting on the perfect fifth of the E minor chord, resolving up to the root. All right, so that's just five to one, which then comes down to the flat seventh, giving us that tension. All right, so the flat seventh, like I said before, a very bluesy interval, and then down to the minor third, also a very bluesy interval. These are all bluesy intervals, and then sliding to the fifth once again. So that's a starting point. So we're actually dancing around the fifth. That's the melodic device here. All right, and then this comes down. The fifth resolves to the third, and then we do the same motion up high here which is the same as this, right? I mentioned that before, but this is B going to E, fifth to root, and then fifth sliding down to the flat seventh, all right? So you're doing the same motion, but the notes on the way down here don't matter as much except the ones that you're landing on, okay? So like I said, this is all an E minor seventh. We're not really using the diminished at all. The diminished is basically just resolving, and then we're using the notes of the resolved chord. There's also a bit of call and response happening between this lead and the rhythm part as well. Real quickly, let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's the call in the rhythm guitar. See how it's by itself? Once that's finished playing, the lead pops right in. This fills in the space left by the rhythm guitar, which, by the way, does the same in service of the lead coming in now which gives us one more solid ping-pong back to the slide guitar. Leaving this space for the different instruments to do their thing is a very wise compositional move. The final element of this introduction is where Mike Starr comes in with his bass to fill in all of the space underneath to add a nice bed and open E, but there's a little tiny fill that happens that's kind of interesting. And here's that first bass fill of the song. Now the rhythm here is what makes it sound cool, because one of the notes within this is actually completely wrong. Nowhere during this introduction do we hit an A chord, yet that is the first note that he is highlighting. In fact, he's almost highlighting an A7 by doing this. As we know, we have an E7, or an E minor 7th, not an A7. An A would be an 11th, and an A would add a lot of tension underneath, which it kind of does. And it almost sounds wrong, but because of the rhythm, because his rhythmic placement is so good, it sounds right. Listen one more time. The final note in the slide guitar, which is this, the D, is the flat seventh of the E chord. This note helps us get seamlessly into the next section, which is actually in the key of G minor. That D is now the perfect fifth of G. All right, so from the flat seventh of E, we use the same note to get to the G, which is an entirely new key center, and that common tone, which is what we call that, helps us to get there seamlessly and without issue. The guitar riff during the verse utilizes a very unique take on what many guitar players would call the G chord.
So let me go through all the positions first. We start at the 6th fret with that G position, but instead of doing a G chord, we're going to actually omit the A string and the D string as much as we can from this. Sometimes hitting the D string makes sense, like coming into the 1st chord, but let's just omit those two strings for now. But you're going to basically hold that G shape, muting the A and the D string. Watch this. Ready? That's going from the 6th to the 3rd, so B flat to G, and then F to G. Once again, from B flat to G. Down here, 1, F to G. Then we come down, G to F. Then we go B flat to C. off the progression. Another thing that's very interesting about this riff is the ping-ponging between two groupings of strings. The first group, which isn't really a group, but it's an individual low E string being attacked. And then the second group on the high three strings, so G, B, and E at the very top. Now, you're going to hit the low E first, and then slide with the high strings. Alright, you see that? Hit the low E, ping pong to the high, use an upstroke too on that, down, up, and then slide everything with everything ringing, and then upstroke the high three strings again, and that'll get you that sound, and that'll work for every single one. See that? Hit slide, hit slide. You're ping ponging between the low and the high. Low, high, low, high. And that's how you get that nice rhythmic pulse going of course we're holding out those chords as well. That open G in the middle of every single chord has harmonic significance. So the first chord that we play is a B flat, but we have that open G which creates a B flat 6 chord. That's because the G is 6 notes away from the B flat. Then we have the F on top and a B flat again. So this is root 6 5th once again, but that sixth is the open G, alright? And this is what the open G does for all these chords. Of course, an open G on top of a G is just the root, alright? So that's pretty basic. On top of the F, we actually create an add nine, alright? Because the G on top of an F is a ninth. Very nice sound, by the way. When we hit the B flat again, of course it's B flat six. But we hop, when we slide up, we go to a C chord, which has a perfect fifth as the open G. All right, so the G is now the fifth of the C chord, and then we basically come back again. So that's just kind of interesting how the open G plays around with the harmonic content within these chords. There are a couple of other elements going on in this verse that actually enhance the guitar part. So let's get those side by side. Here we have the guitar, bass, and drum parts. The first part I'm going to cover will be the drums because that's the foundation. The drums here are very sparse and give us a slow rhythm to get us into the groove. The bass drum is landing on beat one and the and of two. The snare is hitting on the downbeat of two, but waits until the final beat of the next measure to strike again. This adds a lot of space for the vocals to take over. The bass comes in simultaneously with the guitar, but does something very subtle that adds a little bit of extra color to the harmony. Let's hear the bass along with the drums. Now, rhythmically, the bass is pretty much doing the exact same thing as the guitar, but the big difference is in the very first note that is played. Here's the first part of the bass, and here's the same spot on the guitar. Notice how the bass is starting low on F and moving up to G, while the guitar is starting high on a B flat and moving down to G. This is called contrary motion. Once again, the bass part moves up, and the guitar part moves down, and together they create this sound. 
And of course, no Alice in Chains analysis would be complete without giving some love to the vocals. Lane Staley's vocal during this first verse follows along the G minor scale, which I've put up on the screen. Mind of destructive taste. It's basically a G minor pentatonic idea. <laughs> with the second scale degree added to give it some more color. Remember, Alice in Chains loves color. Just look at that album cover. Immediately following that, we have our first vocal harmony. I choose. Lane is blasting out that high B flat coming down to the G, so flat third to the root, which is exactly the same as the guitar part, by the way. That's pretty cool. Lane is also accompanying himself on a lower harmony going from F, the flat seventh, down to D, the fifth. Together, these create a perfect fourth interval. I An interval highly characteristic of the Alice in Chains sound. The song then progresses into the next verse, but with a little more spunk in the drum groove. So now we have a much more frequent snare hitting on beats 2 and 4, which gives us our classic driving rock sound to make this second verse more energetic than the last. Let's compare the two. Verse 1. Slow and draggy. Lots of space, which is a contrast to the current verse 2. Much more spunk and pop delivered to our craniums. The pre-chorus section, also known as the You Open Fire section, gives us a little bit of a release. The guitars are a little more driving with the chords, and there's some great vocal harmonies on top as well. Let's get into the guitar part first. A relatively simple three chord progression, but it requires two different techniques to make those chords sound a little more interesting. The first technique is bringing it back to basics. We're just playing a regular old F chord right here, a little bar chord at the first fret, and then coming to a C power chord. Alright, so all in all that's F, two, three, four, C. We also have to push the rhythm there as well. Notice how I came in before beat one on that C chord. One, two, three, and four, and, and two, and three, and four, and. You're adding a little more strumming in between as well. And then the downbeat of the next measure is that sixth fret to third slide from B flat to G. With a nice open G strum to keep it driving throughout. So that's what I meant by two different techniques. Regular old bar chord, F to C, and then the open G chord shape that we've come to love from the previous section. This is all still within the same key. We have F, which is now the flat 7th chord. This is basically almost a mixolydian progression. We're starting on the flat 7th. Flat 7 to the 4 chord, and then resolving to, of course, our 1 chord, which is that G minor 7. Flat 7 to 4. simple chords and we go around one more time but before we complete it we do that flat seven to four we're actually going to go to an A chord which is almost a Chuck Berry inspired riff let me play it slowly for you that basically utilizes a palm muting technique going between the 2nd fret and the 4th fret of the D string. This is that boogie woogie sound. The classic 1950s rock and roll sound that I think everybody secretly loves. They might not even know it. I know a lot of kids in Gen Z, they don't know that they like this yet because they don't hear enough of it. It's not on the radio. All right, So we go like this. Go between the 2nd and the 4th, 
but we're basically going to be free on these notes and then palm mute that next one. So anytime you see the frets on the D string, you're not going to palm mute those. Okay, it's only those open A strings in between. Just like this. Mute, 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 mute. Oh, and those mutes are really hard to say in between, but you just have to feel out exactly where they are. A lot of them are on upbeats, okay? Some of them are on the downbeat, but a lot of them are syncopated. Much like a lot of these boogie woogie riffs we've seen on facelift thus far, this is no exception. And basically, this is just a fifth going to a sixth interval. Go, breeze, lightning, go. Right? It's that classic 1950s rock and roll sound. An A5 to an A6 coming back again. And that's also our second Man in the Box reference here. Remember, in Man in the Box, we had... We had that in the pre-chorus section. Well, here, we also have this in the pre-chorus section. Just a slightly different variation of it. Okay, so Man in the Box, Sea of Sorrow, back-to-back -back on the album, they both have some boogie-woogie in there. Now, let us get into the vocal harmonies that happen on the top there as well, because they're going to go right along with all those chords we were just analyzing. Let's quickly go over the notes of the chords that exist here. The notes in the F chord are F, A, C. The notes in the C chord are C, E, G. And the notes in the G minor are G, B flat, D, and F. Let's listen to the high part to see where Lane Staley is hanging around on these chords. You open fire. The first two words, you open, stay static on the F, which is the root of the F chord. You open. The fire goes up a whole step to G, which is the fifth of the C chord. Fire. Jerry's part hangs on the same note for all three words. You open fire. So as Lane ascends with his vocal part, Jerry stays static on the exact same note. You open fire. And the intervals created here are a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. This is followed by an intermittent line sung solo by Lane Staley. That's basically just using the notes of the G minor pentatonic. So keep that fresh in your mind as it's going to be pertinent a little bit later on. It's not until the final line where we get something a little bit different. You open fire. The last fire moves up another whole step in the high part. You open fire. And the low part sees a very interesting move of just a half step. You open fire. The guitar part underneath is rocking on that Chuck Berry riff, which both of the vocal parts take into consideration with the notes that they're singing. Lane is going up to the note A, which is the root note. And Jerry is going up just a mere half step to C sharp, which is the major third of that A chord. Uh, Let's hear both of those together once again. You open fire. Now I'm pretty sure that that note within Jerry's vocal part, the one that goes up a half step, came from his guitar player's intuition. If you play a regular old A major chord, the open one, or just the ACDC version, you have that note that he's singing right on the second fret of the B, all right? And it's the highest note you're going to be playing there as well, so it's highlighted melodically. Um, you open fire. There it is, that half step motion going from C to C sharp. That's how it works right there. So I do believe that his guitar player's intuition took over entirely here. And if you're looking to write stuff like this as well, just look inside your guitar chords for vocal notes that you can sing. You have a lot of them. You have six strings. If you're playing a bar chord, you got six different notes you can choose. So choose wisely and choose creatively.
chorus section from Sea of Sorrow is incredibly simple and only requires three chords to get through. These chords are G, A, and E as they're shown. Just like that, anticipating every single one. Push beats, three, four, one, two, and, and. No down beats here except on the G. And of course that final E is held out into the distance. Now, this G is just an open G, but you're gonna mute the A string, okay? You're gonna play it as if you normally would with the D string in there though, okay? And then, you're gonna have an A major just like we played before, okay? Just the AC-DC style open chords to an E, which is just gonna be a straight up power chord, all right? No funny business here. So G, A, E, which in a progression standpoint is the flatted third to an A, which is the fourth, So we're back to our E minor key center, all right? We've come full circle since the introduction. Now, this A chord kind of acts as the bridge between that G minor key center we had and the E because they both have it within it, basically, okay? And we're using A major, which is now the four chord, um, from that Chuck Berry part, all right? So the Chuck Berry part, using that to get to the key of E major by, of E minor, I'm sorry, just by coming down a whole step to G. Alright, so that A links both the key of G minor and E minor together in that manner, at least within this song. The chords of this chorus are pretty innocuous in the sense that it doesn't really impact the harmony that's going on on the top. So I'm just going to focus on these notes as broadly being within the key of E minor. Let's listen to Lane. Only three notes are sung here. I live tomorrow, you are not follow. It's just E, G, and A when it hits its peak. Very simple, as it mirrors the three chords we saw on the guitar part, right? E, G, and A, or G, A, and E, all right? We're just going between the E and the A in a different way. Jerry's vocal is down a fourth below Lane's part, so we're creating perfect fourth intervals once again on the fifth of the chord. I live tomorrow, you are the fall. B, D, and E are the three notes being used, running parallel below E, G, and A. And just like I said, this creates perfect fourth intervals once again. And although a very simple approach, I think it's undeniable that it's incredibly effective. Let's listen on all the way to the end. As you are in a sea of the final note undergoes a gradual fall in both vocals. You hear how that falls down like a waterfall going into another dimension? This gives us the Alice in Chains stamp of approval, embroidering that final chord with a waterfall of character. That waterfall vocal helps us to transition into the re-intro part, okay? This part. But this time, we are without the piano and we are without the slide guitar, so totally bare bones here. This new approach to that riff gives us even more space than before, which also in turn allows for a broader and larger dynamic contrast going into verse 3. And here is that transition. Life. Having virtually everything drop out and then following it with literally everything coming back in simultaneously is like a massive hit in the face with a rake nonetheless. Great dynamic contrast. Verse 3. Lines cut across my face. Pre-chorus 2. You open fire. And chorus 
chorus to I'll have tomorrow are literally all exactly the same. So I'm going to quit dilly-dallying and just get to the guitar solo already. I'm going to split this up into seven different sections to make it a little bit easier to follow along. Here's the first repetitive lick that kicks off the whole thing. A pretty cool repetitive lick that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the solo. We're basically just using E minor pentatonic shapes, but a repetitive version keeping the pointer finger over here static on the 12th fret and having the other notes bend with the middle finger on the 14th. Like that, it's a whole step bend and then doing a little pull off from the 15th fret of the B string. So when all is considered, You want to do that four straight times in a row. You want to make sure you're keeping your pointer finger brushed up against the G string so you stop any kind of open G noises, all right? Because if you don't have it like that, watch. You get all this extra string noise. You don't want that. You want to keep it as clean as possible. This is also very reminiscent of that sort of Chuck Berry maneuver. A little Johnny Be Good right in there except a little bit faster and more suited to the modern era, or at least the modern era as it was in the 1990s. So you want to do that down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, with the pick, all right? Down, up, down, down, up, down, three picks total. Until you can get that nice and smooth repetitively four times in a row. Then for the final two times, you're going to go up to the high E string first before the final pull off like this. Alright, so that's going to seal the deal. Two times on that, four, two, and then finally a nice big vibrato bend on the 15th fret. That's the root note we're resolving on E, which makes perfect sense. That bluesy theme continues with some nice double stops. I always thought those double stops always sounded like trains or like a train horn. It always reminded me of that. But we're basically going from the 12th to the 14th on both the G and the B string. Doing a little half step bend on both strings, by the way, and resolving down to the 14th fret, hammering into the 12th of the D string, okay? So once again, now these two double stops actually create what's known as the Dorian mode. Check this out. Here we have the two notes G and B being played at the same time. Now that makes perfect sense because G is the minor third of E and B is the perfect fifth of E, so that makes sense. When we hop up to the 14th fret, we're actually creating the conditions for an A major. This is A and C sharp. Now an A exists within the key of E minor, but a C sharp doesn't properly exist in that key. Um, usually it's a C natural, but here it's C sharp. That's indicative of the Dorian mode. So a C sharp is the natural sixth of the E minor, so it gives us a Dorian color, all right, which is very colorful indeed. Very reminiscent of the Allman Brothers and uh, even like Pink Floyd and stuff like that. But still very bluesy nonetheless, and it also sounds like a moving train honking at you because you're in the middle of the train tracks getting in the way of a big delivery. You can't get in the way of a big delivery. Nobody likes that. resolution that happens at the end, that fourth pull off into the twelfth, that's basically the root to the flatted seventh. So once again, we're resolving on E, but on a lower octave. From there, we dip down from the twelfth fret down to the open position. 
Right. Which is a great way to give yourself a sense of range without having to think about it all too hard. And here it is. <laughs> Nice little simple thing. We're coming down into the open range and we're doing a bend on the second fret. 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 That's very fret of you. Stop giving me fret attitudes like that. We're going to go like this. Nice little bend on the second fret. Release into the open and then pull off from the second and do an immediate hammer from the open to the second on the D string. Alright, so once again, just a very stereotypical E minor pentatonic blues idea. Alright, nice little sixteenth notes. A little syncopated. Then we slide to the fourth fret of the G. And do almost a trill on the third and the fifth fret of the B string. So that's going between the notes D and E, the flat seventh, and the root. Once again, it's all E minor 7 just coming back to haunt us every single time. This is actually very reminiscent of the opening, by the way, with the E minor 7 being highlighted so much. So, slide. Very nice. Okay, and once again, I can't believe I'm saying this, we're resolving on the note E. Okay, so this is the third time we have an E resolution at the end of a lick. Crazy. From there, we come back to the 12th fret and hopefully we decide to resolve on something other than an E. We're once again continuing the theme of repetition but here we're on the G and the D string exclusively with some hammer-ons and pull-offs and dip-downs. Here we go, right? I'll play it slow. Okay, so we're basically taking this pattern which is a hammer-on and a pull-off on the 12th to the 14th coming down again. That's just outlining the minor third of the E chord, coming down to the root of the E chord. So that all makes sense. Three, four, it's almost like a sus four being resolved in an E minor context. And we do that five total times in this rhythm. Basically you're going down, up with your pick strokes. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Up, down. Coming down to the 12th fret here, so that's almost like a horse gallop. Check that out. Real slow again. And then immediately coming down 12th fret of the D string. Once again, outlining the root and the flatted seventh. So, really nothing crazy going on compositionally here. It's all just E minor blues, E minor pentatonic, even. Okay, not a lot of blue notes either. But, unfortunately, we have resolved on the same note that we did the last three times. This is the fourth time that we're resolving on an E. Of course, it's an E in a different spot, but it's an E nonetheless. Well, that's four consecutive resolutions on the note E. Let's hope this next funky section does anything other than an E. Otherwise, I'm about to blow a gasket. <laughs> Keeping that theme of repetition alive, but this time we're just using octaves to move along the scale. So, we're starting at the 12th fret of the D and the 15th fret of the B. And then coming down to the 14th fret of the A and the 16th fret of the G. Okay, so these are all notes within the E minor 7th chord. This is the flat 7th. Here's the root. And then the 5th much like what we've been outlining this entire time. Okay, and then we go like this from the 12th fret octave. That just resolves back into that note. And then 10th fret octave to the 7th fret octave. All right, so D to E, D to B, and then A to B, G, E, E coming all the way down that chord shape, basically. All right, so one more time real fast. And this repeats twice. And you want to make sure you're getting that pick going. Ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Mostly downstrokes on those accents, but the second one of each phrase is going to be on the upstroke. Okay, so down, up, down, down, down. It's very important where your pick lands so you can keep 
um, basically that rhythmic structure intact the entire time. Now, I know I glossed over it because I'm trying to uh, trying to keep this out of my mind, but right here is another resolution on the note E. This time, it's on a pretty common E as well, the seventh fret of the A string. We hit that a lot as guitar players, and I can't believe this, honestly. This is basically the fifth and sixth resolutions on the note E, all right? At this point, I'm not even sure I'm mad anymore. Let's see if we can keep it going. The next lick follows a similar pattern with those octaves, but adds a different ending toward the end, obviously. So we're combining some of the elements that we saw earlier with these octaves that we added in just now. So we start off exactly the same, look. But there we're just going to go right to the 12th fret single notes on the D string and then back to the octaves immediately following that. Right into the 11th and 13th fret, just like this, not the 11th, 13th and 15th fret, I'm sorry, like this. And watch, that goes between B flat, A to G, and super syncopated. Watch. We have that down, up, down motion going with the pick once again. Down, up, down, and then here, double stop coming back into the fold. These three notes, that's just a straight up E minor triad. Root, flat third, and fifth. And when you play them all together, just a nice bluesy way of playing an E minor triad. Um, once again, resolving on the note E. I'm starting to get mad again. I was kind of forgiving before, but you know, just a little bit of time passes, a couple minutes, and I'm fuming at the ears right now. So watch this again. And there's your resolution coming out of that. I'm sort of at a loss with how many times this has resolved to the note E, the root note, the most boring note of them all, but also the most functional note. So if you can make something functional, less boring, like I think Jerry Cantrell is actually doing here, um, you'll be successful in the way that you write your solos. Now, we have one more lick here, and we can't possibly resolve on E, could we? We could very possibly resolve on E once again, alright? So the final resolution, the eighth time through, we're resolving on E. And we're basically starting with more E minor pentatonic stuff, but this time in the low register. Jerry Cantrell is known to go through all different registers on the guitar, and here we're hitting uh, pretty much the lowest we've hit so far. So, hammer on, 5 to 7 on the low E string. That resolves to the 5th of the chord. And then, hammer on, 5 to 7 on the A string. Actually, I lied. Don't hammer on. Just do two regular hits. That is a flat 7 to the root. And then you're going to go to the 7th fret, right down to the 7th fret of the A string. So 7th to D, with that bend and release down to the A. And then 5th, grab with your pointer finger. That's the flatted 3rd. A little bit of attitude in there as well. So one more time. Hammer, boom, boom, boom. guitar would play. Okay, so we're kind of building that fortress of the chord that's being held out in the rhythm guitar and this lead guitar tone going at the same exact time. So really adding a nice amount of beef underneath for that E to settle about. Every single damn resolution in this solo goes to an E. The root note, the most functional of the notes, the most boring. We have an E over here. We have an E down here. We have an E over here. We have an E up here. We have an E over here. We have an E here. We have an E over here. We also have an E over there. And we have an E over here. We have so many E's, I can't even uh, wrap my head around how many E's are actually in here. Now, that doesn't make it a bad solo. In fact, I kind of appreciate its utterly brazen simplicity, okay? Think about it, there's no real barn burning going on in this solo, if you know what I'm saying. Jerry Cantrell is just playing some regular ass riffs, a lot of repetition, and keeping it simple, really. 
You know, we're resolving on the root note every single time, so it can't be that complex now, can it? Now this guitar solo was actually completely pivotal in my life as a guitar player, so just a little anecdote here. This first part, that repetitive lick, I wanted to learn that really badly. I said, wow, that sounds really cool, I want to give that a shot. And in my mind, as a teenager learning how to play guitar, that was one of the coolest sounds I've ever heard in my life, with the chords going on underneath, and then this playing on top, nice and melodic, nice and flowing. It felt like I was being freed by the sound of the guitar. So I decided, hey, I'm going to give it a shot, and I never looked back since then. So I owe Jerry Cantrell an extreme debt of gratitude for allowing me this to happen. Following the guitar solo, we come into pre-chorus three, which is basically the same as the first two, but this one has a vocal variation in between the harmonies. Let's listen to Lane's part. And your mark was true. And there it is. And your mark was true. It's a higher range variation, which ascends to the first three scale degrees of the G minor chord. <laughs> then descends, eventually landing on the flat 7th. So perfectly outlining the G minor 7th. Let's listen to the two variations side by side. Here's pre-chorus 1 and 2. And your mark was true. And then this one, pre-chorus 3. And your mark was true. This is a solid production and songwriting move that keeps it from being boring. So we're changing it up for the last time around. And the variations don't stop there. We actually have a change in the guitar part that happens as well. And it happens during that Chuck Berry part. It's half the length, and then we do some crazy pick slides a la Kiss. Almost like Ace Freely is there getting pulled by a tugboat at 126 miles an hour, just getting smacked on the water. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 just like that part is only half as long as well. I mentioned that already, but look at this. You only have a couple mutes in between there and only a few accents, but you stop after basically the first couple times you play it. One more time. Yeah, and then we go right into the chorus. All right, so just an itty bitty change to keep it going along. And we've been seeing those subtle changes as the song progresses. Now while we're here, we might as well talk about the drum part a little bit, because it's kind of interesting. I always like the approach of drummer Sean Kinney when it comes to this transition back into the chorus, each time that it happens. Let's listen to the three different fills that occur during each pre-chorus. Here's pre-chorus one, pre-chorus two, and this final one, pre-chorus three, as Ace Freely falls down a water slide getting eaten by alligators. The exaggerated triplets on display here give these transitions an extremely unique feel to them. It's almost as if the drums are pulling you along for a ride for almost a completely different song, very temporarily. And you have no idea about it. You're just getting sucked into a whirlwind of Tom-induced rimming on your weenus. This final chorus section basically just repeats until it fades out. No variations in the vocals. I live tomorrow. I will not follow. All that stuff is exactly the same and continues on until the fade out has concluded. But there are some things that happen within the instrumentation that do occur before the fade out. The first time through the chorus, the guitar and bass are doing exactly what they did the first two choruses. On the second repeat, however, the bass changes its approach each time it hits the E chord. Mike Starr opts to play very staccato or short eighth notes to give it a feeling of a pulse. A bum 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 bum. Listen again. A very simple way of making this chorus feel different or more special than the others. It also helps give the fade out a little more fade, if that makes any sense. Now Mike Starr is not the only one who decides to do some thumping as the song fades out. Jerry Cantrell joins in on the fun after exactly 10 times through the chord progression. 
check it out. It's a great rhythm, but Jerry, I'm sorry, Mike Starr has the edge here. He was the true trailblazer of this idea to add in those staccato notes. You're just a straight up poser, my friend. But let's get into the part anyway. After 10 times through the regular chords, we're going to be hitting regular ass power chords like this. All in the same rhythm. Look, and, and. We're still anticipating each measure, except the first. G is on the downbeat, A is on the upbeat, E is on the upbeat as well. So the only chord on the downbeat is G, the very first one. And we're doing straight eighth notes all the way through. To simulate Mike Starr's original idea. And basically that just carries us through the entire song and of course carries us to the end of this video. Thank you very much for everybody coming along on this journey. All right, It's been a somewhat long one. There's not really too much to say about this song. It's kind of simple, but that intro and re-intro is very sophisticated, especially for this genre. Very jazzy. An E minor 7 flat 5 going to a regular E minor chord. That's some crazy stuff, let me tell you. And that's usually only seen in the jazz world. The heavy rock world doesn't explore this all too often, except when you're listening to Alice in Chains, of course. Now, if you would like to further support the channel, please go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music. You can pledge any amount of money per month that you wish. And there's also a $20 option that gets you access to the Romanova Guitar Gym, which is basically an exclusive series of videos catered to you. Okay? Um, you could also leave a tip on my PayPal. You could also just subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and comment on the videos, all right? That's going to help me against this amorphous jellyfish that is the YouTube algorithm. All right, everybody, that's going to be a good night for me, and I will see you on the next one in due time. But until then, keep on jamming, and make sure you get every single note down. Otherwise, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be disappointed in you, okay?